if you've been tracking with our story, the Exodus has revealed the heart condition of Israel. They are whiny grumblers. They grumbled and complained against Moses by saying he made their work harder when he first spoke to Pharaoh. Next, they grumbled against God by the Red Sea, accusing Moses of bringing them there to die. And on our last episode, we got to see their bitter hearts revealed in the better waters of Mara. And they aren't close to being finished with their grumbling. Our text today says that the entire nation are grumblers. The whole congregation grumbled, it says in verse 2 of Exodus 16. They grumbled against God's plans, not just for their food, but for their salvation. Last week, we connected all of this to our lives as Christians. And if you missed it, what we were saying is, if you have put your trust in the living God, Jesus Christ, believing that He is not only our Creator, but He's also our Redeemer, that He is the God-man who, being very God, took very real human nature onto Himself so that He would be our perfect substitute on the cross, dying for our sins and freeing us from evil and death once and for all. If you have believed in that Christ, then He has immediately and instantaneously and completely saved your soul. The moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, He transfers you out of the Egypt of our slavery to sin, and He exoduses us right into His kingdom forever. You're completely saved spiritually by faith in Jesus Christ, just as completely as Israel was saved out of Egypt physically and its bondage over their lives. And yet, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and all that has happened, God has more in store for your life. Like Israel here in Exodus 16, the Christian is on a journey with God through the wilderness of this world. As we walk with God, He has so much still to reveal to us about who He is, who we are in Him by faith, and how He desires us to live for His glory right now. Exodus was written in such a way that we are supposed to look upon Israel as foolish. But as we look upon their foolishness, we are supposed to be reminded of our own foolishness. Israel was now saved, but they were only spiritual babies, infants in faith. They had lived 400 years plus locked into evil and slavery. God changed their condition instantly, yet their minds and their hearts are going to need to be reshaped by Him over decades. They were largely ignorant of who Yahweh really is and who they were themselves and what He was all about. They still lived at this point with a slave mentality. Their reflex was to sin, to want to go back into bondage, to return to serving an old master. Yahweh took Israel out of Egypt, but it's going to take Him longer to take Egypt out of Israel. And dear Christian, is this not true of us too? We have trusted in God as our Savior. We follow Jesus. He has delivered us. We know that He alone is Lord. We have renounced other fake gods. We've begun to smash the idols in our lives. We've stopped believing in ourselves. Yet so often do we not also foolishly struggle to still trust that God is God that God is good. And isn't that especially true when you face trials and everyday struggles? We're tempted to turn to other means to satisfy our deepest longings. And often we even grumble against the Lord, the very God who cares for us, who loves us, who provides for us in abundance. So our main question again as the people of God as we read this is, will we really trust 
that in Jesus, God has provided everything that we need, true food, true bread for salvation, for godliness, for an abundant life. Again, that way that God shapes us after we put our faith in Him on this journey with God through this wilderness is called sanctification. We have been freed by Jesus once we put our faith in Him from the penalty of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for us. We are out of hell. We belong to heaven. But now the God, the Holy Spirit, indwells us to continually save us from the power of sin over our lives. He's shaping us to see our grumbling hearts, to convict us of our sin, to reveal to us progressively and steadily how glorious our God is, how worthy He is of our trust and faithfulness, and how to obey Him in ways that bring glory to His name and shine His glory to a dying, watching world. This is the spiritual process of making us into saints that God oversees and He empowers in which we also cooperate with Him. We cooperate with Him in this greatest goal of human life. We become increasingly like Jesus Christ. We desire, we trust, we love, we act, we believe, we sacrifice, we live in faith, we walk by the Spirit, we live for the Father's glory in ways that increasingly look more authentically like Jesus Christ. And God often is doing that reshaping of our minds and hearts to be like Him through trials, through struggles. Israel here is intentionally being led by Yahweh through times of difficulty and testing so God will develop their spiritual muscles and faculties as they put their trust in Him, as they obey, as they stay faithful. Again, as the church... We now live in this wilderness between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And until you are taken home to heaven or Jesus comes back to earth, in that period in this wilderness, the Lord is shaping us, reshaping us in Christ's likeness, conforming us to be like Him more and more as we know Him more and more. And as we know Him increasingly, we trust Him increasingly. And as we trust Him increasingly, we worship Him increasingly. And as we do so, we find true fulfillment and satisfaction and flourishing as we live with Him. Last time, Yahweh used bitter waters to reveal bitter souls. And then He changed that water, not only to nourish them, but to save them. In today's text, the Lord again is going to bring glory to His name by showing Israel and us that He can provide for our every need. Our most basic needs, bread and food and water, and our deepest spiritual longings for meaning and truth and fulfillment and salvation. Let's open our Bibles to Exodus 16. We're going to read this whole part. It's on page 58 if you want to use the Bible in the pew. And again, if you need a Bible, please take that one with you. It's our gift. But let's look at God's Word together in verse 1. They set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. Now, this is a, a way to read the Bible don't make everything an allegory. This is just sin. You could also spell this with a C. It's got nothing to do with human sin. They will sin there, but you don't want to allegorize that. It's just a place. And on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt, if you remember, God had delivered Israel from Mara to this oasis called Elim. There's 12 springs of water. There's 70 palms But now it's time for them to head back into the wilderness where God is going to further test and shape and grow them spiritually. Many of us know this for ourselves. We learn a lot about God in times of abundance, but you learn a whole lot more in those desert times when you have to even more clearly 
depend on him moment by moment. So now Israel is going to do that. They're going to head south and east, deeper into the unknown. Verses 2 and 3, And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. It's a nation of grumblers, folks. And everyone is against Moses and his brother Aaron, which those two are going to rightly understand is really not about them. This grumbling is against the Lord. And this grumbling is so disturbing and so revealing to us on many levels. Number one, their grumbling is actually unfounded. They didn't have water, that was true, and God supplied water. But here, they're not actually starving. They say they are, but we know if you continue to read the story, because in the next chapter, they're complaining about water for their livestock. What does that tell you? They still have sheep and cows. They could still drink milk. They could still make cheese. They could still butcher and roast one of those animals if they have to. Psalm 78 says, here's the problem. They didn't have the food they craved. Their problem wasn't food, it was a desire. The issue wasn't need, but greed. Desires for something they want, but it's not necessary for their survival. I wrote down in my Bible this week, Kyle, how much of your discontent in life is just that? How much of your grumbling is over things that aren't really essential, but things you crave for and long for that you think you need. The Lord has promised to give us daily bread. And that's really, when you think about it, all we need. But we live in a society of accumulation, and we're frankly very spoiled people. And we want more and more, even when we have more and more. Number two, though, their grumbling is delusional. It's delusional. In Numbers 11, verses 5 and 6, we get more of this. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there's nothing at all but this manna to look at. I mean, you want to say, Israel, can we be real with each other? Did you really have pots of meat back in Egypt and free fish with a whole buffet of delicious side dishes to boot? Did you really have that? Were you really full and stuffed on Pharaoh's bounty while he had his foot on your throat? Is that true? Were times back then really so good and wonderful? But dear saints, as you read this, can you not relate to how delusional and manipulative sin is? Sin lies to us. It tells us about the good old days before we surrendered to Christ. Remember how free you were? It tempts us. Remember how satisfied you were with yourself before you surrendered to Jesus? It tempts us to think that things were better and we should turn around and go back. That's what Israel is saying here. Let's go back to Pharaoh. Let's go back to slavery. And that's where the second bit of this craziness comes in. They look at Moses and Aaron, two men who are devoted to the Lord's salvation plan for them. They're being patient and merciful. But Israel calls them homicidal, even genocidal. They say, you're trying to kill us. The very people that are putting up with them so they can be free. In sin, this is what happens. We look at what God meant for good, and we call it evil. And we look at evil, and we call it good. We look at slavery and think it's freedom. We look at freedom in Christ and call it slavery. And that leads us to the third thing, and the, and the worst thing about this is their grumbling is really anti-God when you get down to it. In verses 7 and 8, Moses is going to point out that Israel is not grumbling against him and his brother. That's why they don't get defensive. 
They don't need to give their resume about how much they've tried to help Israel. They say, what you're doing is you're grumbling against the Lord. We're just following His plans. And what you don't like are His plans. They're anti-God grumblers. The Lord has redeemed these people for the most amazing purpose of human life, to rightly worship Him, and in worshiping Him to find true freedom and fulfillment. But what do they say here? Would we have died in Egypt? They're saying, Lord, it would have been better if you didn't save us. God redeemed their lives, and they want to die. And still something worse. God has freed them for the purpose. This is the theme of Exodus. He's freed them to worship Him, to be with Him, to serve Him. But what do they say? Really, we'd like to go back and serve Pharaoh. He's our Lord. He gave us good stuff. One commentator says Israel chants a different version of Patrick Henry's famous line. Theirs is, give us bondage or give us death. But this whole thing isn't so much about food. It's about God's plans to sanctify His people. But Israel, very much like the church today, they grumble against the very plans God is using for their benefit to grow them, to shape them. God brings us to places like this in this life to teach us, to teach us to trust Him, to believe in Him, to know how faithful He is, to know that He alone can provide our deepest longings and most basic needs. But instead of embracing those moments for what they are, we so often grumble against them. God, why this? Why now? Why here? Why me? And your dissatisfaction and my discontent and our depressing outlook on our circumstances is very often discontent and dissatisfaction with God. He is sovereign over all things, isn't He? He providentially provides and shapes His people. Well, wherever He has brought us, whatever is happening, He's in control. And if we're grumbling against the very means He uses to shape us, our grumbling is against God. We were rebelling against His leading. We were saying, God, you're not doing the best that I deserve. We are letting our circumstances shape how we see God. And that's the polar opposite of the verse many of you know by heart. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Our joy in our Redeemer should not shift based on our circumstances. Rather, our circumstances, our situations, should lead us to look upon the Lord, to rely on Him, and rejoice in Him all the more. Instead of grumbling, we might try in those moments an honest prayer, just asking, Lord, what are you teaching me here? I think you've brought me here to reveal something about who you are and who I am as one of your people and how much I need you. Forgive my distrust. Change my bitter grumbles into sweet praise. Transform me into the person that you want me to be the person who's more and more like your precious son, Jesus Christ. Well, with that, let's go on to verses 4 and 5. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Again, undeserving people who are going to get the grace of God. And it's God's gift is bread from heaven. You notice that as you read the text, Moses and the Lord, Yahweh, they they never call this manna. That's a word the Israelites give it. They call it bread from heaven. And it's meant for far more than physical sustenance. The Lord is teaching them here to know and to trust that He will supply all of their needs, physical as well as spiritual, and He will satisfy their deepest longings, physically, emotionally, socially, spiritually. Moreover, what the Lord is teaching them and teaching us here is that we are to live by, live on His Word. 
He says here, I want to see if they're going to walk in my law. That's the word Torah. That's saying, I want them to walk in my ways. He wants them to depend on him, to trust his promises. He says, I will feed you. I will. I will get you to the promised land. He will. They will live by his word, not just by bread. That's why later Moses is going to write in Deuteronomy, he humbled you and let you hunger and he fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Our deepest longings, our greatest needs are satisfied by God's good word. Both his revealed word, the Bible, that gives us his laws, his promises, his covenants, his teachings, his revelations, and by his word, Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus quoted these exact words. They might be familiar to you, even if you haven't read Deuteronomy, because you've read Matthew 4, where Jesus quotes these words to Satan. If you remember, Jesus is in the wilderness. And he's tested, he's tempted, because Satan wants him to grumble against his father. He wants him to stop depending on his father. And Jesus, being fully human, was really hungry, just like Israel. Satan tempted Jesus to turn rocks into bread, something that he could have easily done. Instead, Jesus says, no, I live on the promises of my Father. I live on His words. Jesus knew what He came to teach us to know, that our deepest needs are not really physical. They're spiritual. We can eat bread and still die. But for those who trust in the Word of God, who bank on His faithful promises, He will take care of His people, both physically and spiritually. This is already part of the gospel here when you connect those dots. Jesus passed all of his tests in the wilderness. Do you see that? All the tests that Israel failed, all the tests that we fail, because Jesus never stopped trusting in his Father. He was never sinning, not even a slight grumble. He was always trusting the promises of the Lord. And that's the reason that you can put your trust in Jesus Christ. That's also how He saves us. Not only did Jesus Christ die for us, but you need to remember this, saints, He lived for us. Jesus' perfect life, sinless, even when He was tempted, He lived on our behalf. Jesus lived the perfect life that Israel could not. He is the true Israel. He lived the perfect life that you cannot. He was righteously glorifying the Father at every turn, in every thought, in every moment. His perfect record is counted to you as righteousness when you put your faith in Him. And now as we follow Jesus, He wants us to live moment by moment on His Word, the Word of God, trusting what He says, obeying what He says, finding ultimate truth, purpose, and joy in living out what He says, And it's no secret to do that. You have to open your Bible and read what he says. Verse 5, on the sixth day when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Yahweh's instructions for gathering this double portion of the manna or the bread from heaven on the sixth day and then resting on the seventh day is going to shape the future for Israel and how they relate to their work and their God, a pattern of regular work and rest. This is going to get more revealed in the fourth commandment, which we're going to look at. The Lord is teaching Israel here to trust Him for their daily provisions. And again, God is so kind and so wise. He's teaching them to rest when they're not even in the promised land yet, when they're not even cultivating the land. He's giving them lessons that are going to become more and more important once they are there. But they need to know now that the Lord provides the manna day by day. It's going to be no different that He provides the harvest season by season, and they can rest in Him. 
verse 6 through 8. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Egypt knew who the real Lord was in the plagues. Yahweh said, I'm doing this so they will know me. They knew who the real Lord was when their army was drowned in the sea. But now to his children, Yahweh is saying, you will know me as you taste and see that I am good, as you see how I care and provide for your needs as I feed you. But we see here again, Israel's spiritual maturity, immaturity is revealed. They still need to know so much about how glorious, how good, how righteous the Lord is, how steadfastly loving Yahweh is towards them. They need to know and believe. They need to understand and appropriate for themselves the promises of God. All these truths that God is disclosing, He wants them to know Him so that they will trust Him. They need to know that He is their Redeemer, He's their Deliverer, but they also need to know He is their companion. He's with them. He's their provider. He's their healer. He is the one who is patiently looking after His chosen children. And they've grumbled against the very character of God. They treated Him as that He's not so glorious. So how does God respond? In magnificent grace, He says, I'm going to reveal more glory to you so you know who I am. There's going to be this Shekinah glory cloud as well as His gracious provision as he feeds these unloving and unlovely grumblers. Dear ones, you need to know too that every time the Lord provides, he does so for his glory. The whole reason for the exodus, the whole reason for your exodus in Jesus Christ is to the glory of God. Why God does anything is for his glory, that he will be glorified, will know how glorious he is, and that we will more trust Him, and that as we trust Him, He will be more glorified as our Savior and the provider for our souls. Israel is going to see this physical manifestation of God's glory, sometimes called the Shekinah cloud here. They're going to see that He is present with them, that He's protecting them. They will visibly see it, but they're also going to taste His glory. They're going to see how glorious He is, not just in the cloud, but in how He provides bread from heaven and quail from heaven to undeserving people by His providential sovereign grace. When you see that word in the Bible and you talk about God's glory, what it really means is His weightiness. It's the weight, it's the, the, the power, the presence of His honor and His holiness of His royal character it's kind of like the sum total of all His perfections, of all His divine attributes, and all that He is, and all that He does. And so God here gives Israel a glimpse of His glory. Again, in the manifestation and in the provision, He wants them to know that He alone has glory and that they will know Him and trust Him. And dear ones, sitting here today, you and I probably miss this, but God is just as gloriously revealed to you and I every single day. Who gave you the food that you eat? Who gave you those clothes you're wearing? Who shelters you and protects you? Who put gas in your car? Who gave you your family? Who gave you the means and the opportunity to work and earn a living? Who is your true provider? Is it not God? And in each of those things and in many, many more, are you not to turn around and praise Him for how glorious He is? 
that he is your glorious provider, not just of physical things, but of salvation itself. So will you give him glory? Will I give him glory for the things he does on a daily basis that are so glorious? This is at least one reason you ought to pray before you eat a meal. Because you didn't really put that food on the table. You didn't really just earn all of that that paid for the food on the table, right? It was made and it was provided and delivered to you by God no less gloriously than the manna in the desert. And He has not again just gloriously provided bread on your table, but salvation for your soul. So rejoice in Him. Verse 9, Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for He has heard your grumbling. Boy, there's grace for you. God ushers grumbling, grumbling malcontents into His presence. He says, Come closer. Come near to the Lord. He's heard your grumbling. He wants to show you something. Verse 10, And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Verses 11 and 12, And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God. This miracle of quail, if you're taking notes, wasn't an every evening thing. This miracle was only repeated once, I believe. It's recorded in Numbers chapter 11. And quail is a small game bird. It's plentiful in the Middle East. One ancient writer, Herodotus, recorded that Egyptians found this to be a fancy meal, a delicacy. So with tons, I think, of glorious irony, the Lord is saying, I'm going to feed you with something in abundance that's far better than those pots of meat that you imagined. And it's coming from me and no one else. And he says in a way, I'll show you what fool really is. The the verb he uses that you will be filled is, he copies their verb from verse 3. He says, you want to know what really fool is? Look at this. And will Israel taste this meat And this bread that come from heaven, Yahweh says, this is so that you will know me. You will taste and see that the Lord is good. Verses 13 through 15. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word manna appears to be connected to the question, what is it? In Hebrew, you see, Israel had never seen anything like the Lord is providing. They've never tasted anything like this. There's no natural explanation. This is supernatural. But notice, they don't even comprehend the blessings of the Lord. The Lord is not just gracious to provide it. He sends Moses to exegete the miracle for them. He says, you know what this is? He said, no, we have no idea. Let me explain to you. This is God's bread. Numbers 11 describes it this way. Now the manna was like coriander seed and its appearance like that abelium, which is usually taken to be like pearlescent color. The people went about and gathered it and ground it in hand mills or beat it in mortars and boiled it in pots and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was like the taste of cakes baked with oil. The description sounds delicious. This bread from heaven is, Psalm 78 says, it's the bread of the angels. In 1 Corinthians 10, Paul calls it spiritual food, meaning it's supernatural. It's hand-delivered by God to His people. There's Jewish lore from the Babylonian Talmud that says that the manna tasted like whatever you wanted it to taste like, like some Willy Wonka fantasy or something. And they even go on to say it tasted different to different people. Children tasted honey, young people tasted bread, elderly tasted oil. The Bible doesn't say any of that. It says it's kind of like a pastry baked in oil. 
And the great Bible expositor David Goodsack says, I know what it is. These are heavenly donuts. Healthy, healthy heavenly donuts. But we know God is good. Verse 16. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each of you, as much as he can. You shall each take an omer, that's about a half gallon, according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And notice again, and connect this with what it says in Numbers, the Lord is providing everything they need. And in the sanctification process, not the salvation, in the sanctification process, he's inviting them to get involved in the learning process. They have to gather it. They have to bake it into bread or boil it. They're getting involved in this learning process. Verses 17 through 18, the people of Israel did so. They obeyed. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. Notice everyone has enough for their need, and they're to take as much as they need, not as much as they greed. They're going to trust the Lord that He's going to provide every day and every night. Verses 19 and 20, and Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till morning, but they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was angry with them. Yahweh's asking them again, will you walk in my ways? Will you trust my word? I promised you I'd feed you every day. You don't need to hoard or store up. Many still answer, Lord, we're not sure you're going to come through, so we're going to take means into our own hands. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. And the refrain again that's easy to hear and harder to live out is again, God is teaching man is not supposed to live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Trust my promises, he's saying. And do you see that the word of the Lord is even controlling the conditions of the bread? It got wormy and disgusting when they did what God said not to do. Well, the lesson is, don't you understand that the Lord, by his word, is controlling the conditions of your life? Trust him. Verse 21 Again, daily dependence. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On to verses 22 through 24. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow's a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Again, God is teaching them to trust Him, that His Word comes true. He can provide for them. And He's also teaching them something. He's going to continue to shape them as they come into the promised land, to set aside a day to worship Him. Remember again, the whole point of Exodus is to get them out of Egypt in false worship, even a works righteousness kind of idolatry system, so that they will rest in the Lord, that He is enough, that He alone is God, and that they will set aside a day just to praise Him and to be with Him and to worship the one living God. Verses 25 through 27, Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. I wrote in my Bible, how realistic. I do the same thing. They see the goodness of the Lord rain down from heaven They see his glory. They taste how good he is. And five minutes later, they struggle to trust him. How realistic. Verses 28 through 29. And the Lord said to Moses, he kind of takes this out on Moses because he's the representative of Israel. How long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. 
Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. Verse 30, so the people rested on the seventh day. They obey his word. They trust his word that it's for their ultimate good and his ultimate glory. Verse 31, now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Verse 32, Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Let an omer of it be kept throughout your generations, so that they may see the bread with which I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. What is Yahweh doing? He wants them to remember. Remember His goodness. Remember His word. And that when they trusted their, His word, there was fulfillment and flourishing. He wants them to not forget because he knows they are prone to forget. He wants to give them hard evidence of their faith. Verse 33 and 34, Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and place it before the Lord to be kept throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron placed it before the testimony to be kept. This is all still future at this point. This is written later on The testimony are the tablets of the Ten Commandments, which the Lord is going to give in Exodus 20, and they're going to be placed in an ark, which at this point is not built. And again, they're going to show together the Ten Commandments and this omer of manna that the word of the Lord is to be lived on for daily life. Verse 35, the people of Israel ate the manna 40 years till they came to a habitable land. They ate the manna till they came to the border of the land of Canaan. The people were provided by the Lord until He delivered them to the promised land, just as He promised. Well, let's come to wrap this up by looking at the gospel. And this will lead us into our time of communion as well. Turn with me in your Bible to chapter 6 of the Gospel of John. It's really worth opening your Bible for this. Chapter 6 of John. Jesus has just proved himself to be the greater Moses and to be God in the flesh by feeding thousands, maybe 10, 15,000 people, giving them bread in the middle of nowhere. And then they go looking for him. So look at John chapter 6, start in verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, that's amen, amen. I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You want God to just bless you with stuff. Verse 27 He tells them, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which is the Son, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? What do we do to please God? What do we do to get saved? Jesus answered them, verse 29, This is the work of God. This is what God wants you to do that you believe in Him who He has sent, Jesus Christ. You want to know what God wants from your life? He wants you to believe in Him. He wants you to believe in His Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 30, so they said to Him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Meanwhile, He's just fed thousands upon thousands of people. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, much like the Samaritan woman at the well, Give us this bread always, thinking again of only their physical needs. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. In John, he has these many I am statements, which each one announces, I am God. And he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. 
You put your trust in Jesus Christ as I satisfy your deepest longings of your soul. Verse 36, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. The only way that you come to faith in Jesus Christ is that the Father has provided faith for you and led you to Jesus Christ. And if you put your trust in Jesus Christ, you can never lose your salvation. I will never cast you out. You will have eternal life. A brother who's been recently coming to our church, I asked him, you know, what, what brought you here? Did you grow up in church? Did you just look for a new church? He said, no, I've never been to church, but a couple months ago, I just decided to come. I knew I needed to go. I said, the Lord brought you. How else do you explain it? And now that man who had no background of Jesus or God is reading his Bible furiously, digesting every word of God. Where'd that come from? It came from the Father. It's a miracle. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who has sent me. The Father sent the Son. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Jesus will save you and give you eternal life and bring you to the resurrection. Verse 40, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son, that means has faith, Everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. Who? Everyone. Did you have to be born into a Christian family? No. Anyone. Everyone who does good works. No. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ for who He is. They will have eternal life starting now. And He says, I will raise Him up on the last day, the end of history when Jesus returns. Verse 41 If anyone thinks that the Bible is made up, it has to be the master class of all frauds. How do you connect these stories over 1,500 years? Look at verse 41. So the Jews grumbled about him. What does that sound like? We just read that in Exodus. Astounding. Because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. What are they grumbling? They're grumbling exactly the way Israel grumbled in the wilderness. They're grumbling against the salvation plan of the Lord. We don't like how you choose to save us. We'd rather do something else. They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? He's just a regular guy. How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. Physical fulfillment will not save you. It is not your biggest need. Verse 50, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh, meaning he will die on the cross, fully God, fully human, in our place to redeem us from our sins. Verse 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. True drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever who feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Dear ones, what Jesus is talking about is not something barbaric or cannibalistic. They were confused by this. 
when he says, you have to eat of me and drink of me, he's not even talking about communion. This isn't the way that you are saved. To take, to eat of Jesus means that in a way you ingest him, you appropriate his promises for yourself. You personally trust and believe in him. If you're a starving man and there's a piece of bread on the table, it doesn't do any good just to look at it. You have to eat it. And if you're dying of thirst and there's a cup of the most delicious water on the table, it does nothing unless you put it inside you. You can grow up in church. You can be around Christians. You can call yourself a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian. You can be a member of a church. You can be around other Christians. You can have Bibles on your coffee table. It doesn't do anything if you have not personally ingested Jesus, meaning you have put your faith in him. And what does he do? He comes within you. He unites his life to yours after regenerating your soul. And now you are united to him and he indwells you by God, the Holy Spirit. He is truly within you. And now your life is fused to his. That happens by making that commitment of faith in Jesus Christ. You eat the word who is Jesus Christ. You eat the bread that is from heaven God who came down to satisfy you, not just physically, but spiritually, to forgive your sins, to give you eternal life with him and for him and by him right now. I know many of you have done that, but there's a, there's a lesson here too for us as disciples. Number one, that's the gospel that you need to go share with people. Their longings can only be satisfied by Jesus Christ. And those looking for physical satisfaction will still die in the wilderness if they do not eat and drink of Jesus. But for us as disciples, the lesson here too for us is this. We are to live by God's word day by day, moment by moment. On this process of sanctification, the Lord wants us to know who he is. And that comes from our Bibles. He wants to trust his word. He wants his word to form our worldview our doctrine, our policies, our beliefs, the way we do church, the way we run our home, the way we work, the way we rest, the way we interrelate with each other, the way we fight for justice, the way that we glorify Him. And that comes from being shaped by God spiritually through His living Word, the Bible, and living for the Word who is Jesus Christ. That's why at our church, one thing that we can promise you is we really want to help you read the Bible for yourself because it's that important. We want to disciple you, help you connect the dots between the Old Testament and the New Testament and all of salvation history and apply that to your life and teach you to teach others how to read their Bibles and how to proclaim the truths of the gospel from the Bible. We want to be Bible-saturated, Bible-soaked, Bible-passionate people here at Grace River. We want you to be that because that's a healthy Christian who's well-fed on the Word of God day by day. That's what I believe the Lord wants from Israel. That's what He wants from us today as His people, to live by His Word, to live on His Word.